10x. In other words, if you want a sedan in Denmark, it will cost you about $50,000 to buy, $55,000 to buy the sedan. If you want an electric sedan, it's about $20,000 to buy. And it's sort of an IQ test. They want you to move to Norway if you pick the wrong car. So we created a more convenient car that is actually cheaper to build. We didn't build the car. We don't make the car. We went out to the car companies around the world. And the first one to pick up on this idea is Renault. Renault came up and originally thought this would be a great experiment. Roughly about two, 3,000 cars a year in Israel. That was the first country that said, let's go do it. There's a great story behind that, and I'll tell you that in a second. But they thought it's going to be 3,000, 4,000 cars at best in Israel. That's the amount of cars they sell every year in Israel. Renault cars they sell in Israel. Once they realized the pricing model and the price differentiation, it is now a car that's slated to sell about 150,000 in the next three, four years. The second car, the upgraded version, is already planned to sell more than a million cars in the first five years. And it's the first mass-produced electric car in history. What does it mean, mass-produced? It went through the entire cycle of production, through the entire industry, sourced from various different places. All the components are made in mass production, in high volume. And the first car was actually put together about a month ago, and we drove it. It drives twice faster than its sister, gasoline sister. It has acceleration that is actually pretty dangerous for most young drivers. It has absolute top torque. Torque is, like, is what you feel when you get planted into your seat at zero kilometers an hour as you press the pedal. It makes no noise, so we're going to download drive tones into it. You'll be able to pick the sound of your car. Imagine driving a Renault car but making the sound of a Ferrari. That will cost you more per kilometer, by the way. But you're able to create a new experience with that car, one that is better and cheaper and more convenient than today's cars. So we're coming to the last question in this entire equation. If you're willing to buy a cheaper car that is more convenient and pay only what you pay for gasoline, can we fit the cost of the battery and the electrons and still make some margin for the people who give you the infrastructure, the new electric kilometer company. You see, when you go to a petrol station, you don't buy petrol. None of you collects petrol at home. There's no petrol tasting competition. We buy kilometers. We buy four, five, six hundred kilometers every time we go into a petrol station. We got addicted the day we bought this shiny object with four wheels. And we buy kilometers at whatever price they ask us. Remember last summer, we went into the petrol station, the price was what? A buck fifty a liter. Anybody here complain with the attendant that it was much higher than they used to be and they're not willing to pay that price? Do you know how much fluctuation in kilometers happened in Australia during the summer of 08? Less than 1%. There is no substance in the world that has higher addiction. If somebody raises the price on Coca Cola by a factor of three, we'll switch out. Even milk will switch out. Water, we'll switch out. Petrol, we're stuck. Why? Because petrol has the biggest monopoly on Earth. 99.9% .9 of cars in the world can only take liquid molecules to drive. And the option is not to buy it or not to buy it. The option is to get to work or not get to work. And so as a result of that, what we do is we drive, we pay about four or five dollars more at the peak of price, and we stop buying Starbucks to compensate. The alternative between driving and not driving becomes the alternative between driving and not buying something else. And as a result of that, economies collapse. How much so? In the aggregate, the G20, in the last 12 months, have saved 1.5 trillion dollars on oil imports, which just happens to be the exact amount of money put in the G20's collective stimulus packages. Oil, the economy. Oil, the economy. That's the equation we have right now. Now, let's look at the cost of electric driving. The cost of the battery divided by the amount of kilometers it could drive, roughly about 400,000 kilometers per battery pack, plus the cost of clean electrons, only clean electrons, windmills or solar, to create absolute zero carbon footprint to drive these cars 
is five US dollars per kilometer. Sorry, five US cents per kilometer. I apologize. I keep doing the same thing. It's US dollar cents per kilometer. Um, five cents a kilometer, US dollar cent per kilometer, multiplied by about 12 kilometers per liter is roughly 60 cents per liter. Anybody here knows where to find 60 cents liter? Now here's the interesting number. That five cent in 2011 numbers becomes three cents in 2015, becomes one and a half cent in 2020. Much like any consumer electronic device, it goes down a curve which cuts in half every period of time. The historic curve has been half every four to five years. And so the price in 2020 is one and a half US cent per kilometer. Let's assume technologies on the car side improve roughly the same way they did before. By the way, I don't know if you know, efficiency in Australia over the last decade improved by 1%. Not per annum, per decade. So let's assume we go 40, 50, 60, 70% better on kilometers. We go to 20 kilometers a liter on all cars in Australia. At one and a half cent, we need to look for a 30 cent liter at the petrol station in 2020. Anybody wants to take bets? Now, what does that mean? It means that there is a huge margin somewhere between now and 2020 on a per kilometer basis. And now comes the interesting part. That huge margin is roughly in the tune of about 10 to 12 to 13 cents per kilometer. There will be a day you will go into a petrol station to change batteries, but when you go buy the car, before you go into the petrol station, they'll ask you how many years do you want to lock your price per kilometer or per month. And if you'll say six years or five years or seven years, depending on the car you choose, they'll give you the car for free. How many of you want to buy a gasoline car right now? How many of you think they can sell that car in three, four years' time? See, that's the amazing thing about this industry. If you don't think you can sell a car, you don't buy it. And if you don't think you can sell a car four or five years out and you don't buy it, car companies should stop designing them five years ago. It's a very long, long, long range industry. A car that will start design today will only be on the road in four years' time and will actually only be sold because it will be leased for the first three years in seven or eight years' time. In other words, anybody who looks at the car industry needs a crystal ball that is eight years long. Anybody here wants to bet that a free electric car will lose to a petrol car in eight years' time? That's the wrong bet to take. The threat of such a change in the industry impacts globally a collective industry of cars and petrol and all the ancillary businesses around it, from insurance to radio to food and gas stations, that aggregates to $10 trillion a year. There has never been a $10 trillion a year shift in the history of economy. And it will happen faster than anyone believes. Why? Because this industry will tip on expectation, not on delivery. Banks will stop financing cars. Leasing companies will not be able to raise bonds. These changes will happen so fast on the expectation of global delivery. And all it takes is one country, two countries, three countries to prove that it happened and after those first two, three sites have happened, there is not going to be a place in the world that will not want to go off petrol as fast as possible. That was a theory written on a paper in the middle of 2006. I handed it over to various different politicians and governments and car companies and oil companies. And by and large, oil companies would stop talking to me at that point in time. Car companies would look at me as if I was nuts. 
And politicians gave me the, it's great that the young generation is thinking about these problems. <laughs> Until I got to the youngest politicians, politician in the world, Shimon Peres, President of Israel, and I presented this case in a, in a closed forum, about 75 um, leaders, both the American administration and the U.S. administration, and Paris jumped in the middle of my presentation, six minutes into my presentation. By the way, I was the counterpoint, I wasn't the point. The point was Daniel Jurgen, uh, who argued he's the most formidable, um, most knowledgeable person in the world about oil, who argued that oil is cheap and abundant. It will fluctuate, but it will always come back to cheap and abundant. I came up with the oil is going to die, and we're going to replace it before we run out of it. Here's how we do it. In the middle of my presentation, President Paris said, do you have anything written about this? I gave him the white paper, expected the same great the young generation. I was surprised to find out that there was a younger politician in office at 87 years old than I was. He called me up two days later and said, come to my office, we need to talk about this paper. You really thought this one through. And within two weeks I went across the entire government, every single office in government pretty much feels that they own this, including the Israeli foreign office now, because there have been 70 delegations to see the Israeli installations and systems that are being put in place in the last six months, more so than the Palestinian issue. <laughs> um, and lots of industrialists in Israel. And after all these meetings for two weeks, I got to the Prime Minister of Israel, Prime Minister Olmert at the time, and he told me the following thing. He said, if you think that we'll give you money to build this thing, $200 million, you're absolutely wrong. But if you find $200 million somewhere else in the world and you find a car company that's willing to build that car in volume, we'll give you a country where you can spend your money. <laughs> President Paris thought that was a very, very fair deal. <laughs> and we ended up actually going out and raising $200 million. I met with 200 different investors, potential investors, and about 10 of them put the $200 million Four, four of which put significant amounts, the other ones have put smaller amounts. There's still, I still claim that there are about 190 people in the world who think I'm absolutely nuts um, from these meetings. And we raised the capital, we met with a few car companies, and Renault actually stepped up and said, we're going to build this car and put a billion dollars into a lineup of cars in a factory for batteries. And the car is now there. We've started the installation, we've set it up in Israel. We announced two months later in Denmark, which was the second country where we were taking this to, and we announced a few months later here in Melbourne that Australia would be the third country. Two reasons why Australia. One, up until Australia, we've been always pegged as the great plan to convert islands away, small islands, away from petrol to electric. We figured out if we do Australia, nobody's ever going to claim we went small. Second reason, Australia is actually a collection of transportation islands. Very, very dense, very sprawling, very long distance. Suburb to town, which is exactly the kind of driving you want to take out. Ends up that while everybody was focusing on the small urban driver who is very green and needs to project a great brand, self-brand, we call that guy Leo DiCaprio. He's the guy who has two electric cars, one of them takes him to the private jet. <laughs> the focus actually needs to be the other 25%. It's Joe the plumber, Joe Sixpack, that drives from outside town, very, very far suburbs, into town, in traffic, every day, an hour to an hour and a half, and back. Those 25% of suburb, exurb commuters account for 66% of petrol usage in any country, including Australia. Take those guys off petrol, and you've solved the problem, literally solved the problem of oil dependence for Australia. In other words, three to four million drivers here would, would solve all of Australia's oil imports, and it can be done in less than a decade. 